Hello everyone, this is John from RPGs and More. And for today's video, I'd like again to talk a little bit about the Cypher system. More specifically, I'd like to talk about monsters in the Cypher system and what makes a monster. In the previous video, I mentioned a very basic formula of how to create your own monster on the fly using the task difficulty system. That is a very good way to get rocking and rolling with very little prep. But if you have some time and you wish to prep a little more thoroughly for your sessions, then you can't go wrong with going through the main rulebook here, the core rulebook, checking out some of the monsters, and getting some good ideas of what creatures you can use. One of the strengths of the Cypher system is that if you do find a monster you like, but you don't like some of the abilities that they have, or you think maybe they're too weak or they're too strong, all you really have to do is raise or lower that monster's uh, difficulty or the task of difficulty of dealing with that monster without necessarily changing any of the flavor of the monster or any of their special abilities. Excuse me. But let's talk about some classic fantasy creatures because like most people, I imagine... Um, this is just my opinion, and I could be very, be very wrong, but I, I believe that the majority of people who come to the Cypher system will come from a background of some form of Dungeons & Dragons, whether that's earlier editions or the current edition. I, and I think that of those that don't necessarily come from Dungeons & Dragons to the Cypher system, there may be some that at least have a basic familiarity with the fantasy tropes that Dungeons & Dragons popularized or fed off of. So, because of that, I'm going to take three fantasy monsters that we're going to look at initially here and talk about their various abilities and where they stand on the difficulty track and how they can be modified. So the first one we're going to go to is the ubiquitous giant rat. Now the giant rat in the rule book is a task difficulty three monster, meaning that the target number for a giant rat is nine. Now when we look at these monsters in more detail, you're going to see more information. So I'm going to summarize what is going to be on a monster entry if you're not familiar with this rulebook. If you are familiar with, familiar with the rulebook, I apologize, bear with me, but you can turn to page 334 and that's where the giant rat is. And you read along with me if you haven't read this already. So the giant rat, like most other monsters, it starts with a motive. Why is it there? Why is it willing to confront the player characters? In this case, t typically it's defense and reproduction. That suggests to me that if you encounter a giant rat in the wild and they are willing to fight, that would mean that either they feel that they're backed into a corner or they have a nest nearby with young that they want to protect. And if your players keep that in mind, since this is an animal, you could, in theory, uh, move around them or find some other way to uh, dissuade them or make them understand that you're not a threat to them. And another way of getting around it if you don't necessarily want to kill them. But maybe they're maybe they've snuck into your uh, your tavern's dungeon or your, sorry your tavern's uh, basement and you just need to kill the giant rats in order to get free drinks for the night. So like we talked about in the previous session. All right. 
The next thing, the environment. They tend to be anywhere in ruins or sewers in groups of one to seven. Okay, that's pretty explanatory and there's a lot of information there. Uh, so really a giant rat is the kind of monster you can find anywhere, in any setting, in any environment within that setting, there could be the conditions in a fantasy world to create a to create a giant rat. Or if you're in the modern world, maybe your city is like New York and they just have New York sized rats. That's fine. So next we look at the health. Now this is interesting because the health is listed looks like Eight. No, nope, eighteen. Uh, that doesn't seem right. I maybe I'm maybe I'm misreading. Nope, that's right, eighteen. So that's a lot more than nine. All right, that's interesting. These rats are pretty 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 beefy for that for some reason. Um, but that gives you an example of where numbers can be a bit of an outlier sometimes. They, just because. Uh, something is on the task difficulty track doesn't mean that it's that it has to follow all those steps repeatedly it's just easier to follow those steps so then we go to the damage inflicted four points one point higher than the three that is its task difficulty rank okay their movement they move a short distance or they can move a long distance while they're jumping. That's useful information when you're creating your encounters because you can create encounters where the giant rats can leap up out of the darkness or they can or if you if the players think that their characters are safe because they have uh, they put some kind of gap between them and the giant rats, suddenly the giant rats are leaping across to come after them. This would especially be uh, possible if the giant rats have been uh, had a spell cast upon them to force them to confront uh, the player characters or any other intruders to an area maybe their eyes are all glowing a, a sickly green to symbolize that they're all been taken over by some malevolent consciousness and uh and so the players kind of they're making their way through this dark dungeon but everywhere they look there's green eyes following them and they're freaking out i mean that'd be kind of cool okay uh modifications uh, perception is at level four. Tasks related to overcoming obstacles and puzzles at level five. That means that that's what the giant rats can do if you feel the need to check on what they're capable of. All right. Combat. Victims damaged by a giant rat's diseased teeth and claws take four points of damage and on a failed might defense roll are infected with a level five disease within 12 hours the victim's lymph glands swell creating visible bulbs every 12 hours thereafter the victim must succeed on a might defense roll or take five points of ambient damage you better hope that you can get yourself a cure disease potion or you know a particular character who is capable of casting a spell upon you using an esoteric in order to uh, cure you of that disease because that's a lot. Giant interactions. Giant rats uh, stubbornly pursue prey, but they flee if that prey proves to be too strong. So your best bet when dealing with a giant rat would be to uh, attack early, attack often, persuade it that you're you're too much of a threat, and get it to run away. Uh, this could be a great way to make giant rats a little a little more scary because they might like initially attack, get hit, get hurt, run away, and then regroup. Especially if there's some kind of malevolent force controlling them, maybe they regroup 
and they kind of recenter themselves and their courage builds back up again and they come at you from different angles because remember these are not necessarily dumb animals uh, they have the ability to use tactics and and think about things okay and then uses a contact of the PCs dies of plague before they can deliver an important message the PCs will have to backtrack the contacts movements to discover what they wanted to say, which leads to a giant rat colony. That's one idea. Uh, we have also talked about a second one. So this is this is all the stuff that goes into a giant rat. This is a quarter of a page. So in the book, it's this part right here. That's it. That that's all the the rules for the for running a giant rat. But the interesting thing about it is the vast majority of this rules is all descriptive text. It's describing what you can do with the giant rat. It's describing what the giant rat's capable of. It's talking about motives, motives a description of what the creature looks like. Uh, there's very little actual rule content. The rule content can be boiled down to giant rat, uh, tar uh, level three, target number nine, health 18, damage inflicted four, movement short, long wind jumping, modifications, perception is level four, and then overcoming obstacles and puzzles, level five. And then the bit about the, the disease. That that's all really the those are that's all the rule information. Everything else is kind of I won't call it fluff because that's not true, but everything else is flavor. It's flavor to give the giant rat more life. So that's that's a basic monster stat. Now how would you modify this? Well, if you want your giant rats to be maybe a little less threatening, but you want to have more of them in an encounter, I would lower that health down. Maybe down, bring it down to 8 instead of 18. And, excuse me, and then let loose with more of them. <coughs> excuse me. Maybe... You uh, remove the disease part of things if you don't want that plague and disease to be part of your adventure and you just, you know, giant rats are just giant rats and they're kind of predatory monsters in the, uh, the sewers and you want to get rid of them uh, and don't want to deal with disease as part of your game. Well, then you just take that part out and, uh, and the giant rats are still, they're still a level three monster uh, and they're still a threat. So that's fun too. That's, those are two different ways you can modify things to make them a little less threatening. But if you want to make them more threatening, then you can increase the level of the disease and how much damage it deals. You can uh, increase the level of the giant rat itself. Maybe this is a larger than usual giant rat. Maybe this is as big as an ROUS. Uh, rodents of unusual size. And it could be, it could be you know, so big that it's almost human-sized and capable of fighting a person on an even keel. So wouldn't wouldn't that be a, a frightening encounter? I wonder if we've ever seen that before in, in fiction or cinema. Hmm. I don't know. That's interesting. Wink. All right. Moving on. The next creature I want to talk about is the goblin. Now, this is an example of a, a stat block that I think is easily modifiable. Most everyone has some image of what a goblin is. So I'm gonna read this out. I'm gonna read this, probably not as much detail as I read the giant rat because now we have a general idea of what's going on here. But let's look at the rules for goblins. A goblin is a level one creature, which means the target number for a goblin is three. Anytime the goblin tries to do something, the players have to defend by rolling a three or higher. Players want to do something to a goblin. They have to achieve it. Oy. Excuse me. That's what I get for doing a video after a long day of work. They have to achieve uh, a level uh, a three on their rolls in order to do something with a goblin. This is your bog standard goblin, the kind of the kind of goblin that is everywhere. I am not really um, a fan of goblins being weaker than giant rats. I'll be honest. I would bump them to at least a three, just like the giant rat, mostly because of that. That way, we can have like uh, maybe the, the goblins and the giant rats are living in the same you know part of the dungeon, and maybe they're riding the giant rats into battle. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Um, 
but let's look at this. So motives, uh, greed and theft, that's your box standard goblin, but you can change that for your own campaign setting and their motives could be maybe the goblins are actually the people that love to, you know, uh, play around with stuff and create new gadgets or maybe your goblins are farmers. You know, maybe your goblins are uh, are traders who load up their little goblin ships and, and fly through the air to different islands in your campaign and, and they, they trade stuff, you know. That's cool. You know, whatever you want your motivations to be, don't feel constrained by what this book writes. This is just to get the juices flowing. Environment, uh, tunnels and caves, usually in groups of 10 or more. Okay, basic info. Again, you can change it however you want, but this gets you started. Health, three. That matches with the difficulty number. Uh, damage inflicted, uh, two points. If they uh, score a hit, their movement is short. Their modifications, tasks related to perception, stealth, and setting traps as level five. So these standard goblins are vicious trap makers. Kind of let that sink in for a bit. So if I was to use this, this goblin as listed, then that instantly tells me that I'm looking for traps. I am looking, these goblins are, their layer, if the, if the PCs are going into a goblin layer, that thing's going to be festooned with vicious, evil traps because these goblins are good at it and they know, they know how to do it and they know how to make it hurt. And they know how to get around them for their own their own safety. So like it's, there's not it's not going to be a death trap for the goblins, but it's going to be a death trap for anyone else that might be threatening these goblins because they know that they're weak, but they also know that if they set that deadfall, then you and you, and their attackers fall into that deadfall, then they can probably stay back from a long distance and poke them to death with long pointy sticks, and the and their attackers probably can't do anything about it if they survive the death the de uh, deadfall. So, thoughts. Okay, uh, combat, goblins attack from the shadows with ambushes and hit and run tactics. When they have surprise, they attack as level four creatures and deal two additional points of damage. All right, again, it's telling us how to use these goblins, how to make them scarier than their level one would suggest. Okay. They attempt to draw larger prey into level 5 traps they've previously set. They often flee in the face of real danger. Well, you know what? If I only had three hit points, I'd be running away from danger too. But a lot of this is information that's very useful. So even in the wilderness, they're setting traps. Uh, when it comes to like hunting for game, these goblins are not going to be hunting with a bow and arrow or a spear. They are going to be trappers. They're going to go out and they're going to check their traps and see what creatures have fallen into their traps. They might dispatch a creature if it's still alive or it's probably already dead. They'll take the meat back to where you know, they'll reset the trap and then take the meat back to their den to be consumed during the rest of the night or the day while they go back to sleep and then come out later. These goblins as written are sneaky. They are vicious. They can be vicious, um, but they are smart. These are smart goblins. Now, keep in mind, nothing in this has necessarily said that they're evil. That's an important distinction that I think Cypher System uh, makes or doesn't make, really, is it's not assuming that the goblins... It does assume that the goblins are uh, greedy and probably steal things. Now... In my world, in my worldview, though, uh, stealing is not a good thing. People who are good, in the classic D&D sense of the term, don't go around stealing some stuff. And the, you can make arguments about Robin Hood all you want. That's still not a good thing. Um, but, again, it's also not necessarily outright evil evil because you can have a good reason for trying to go and and take something you're you you have a higher purpose that is a better purpose it's still not a good 
action, but the higher purpose might be served by it. And so, you know, you could easily fall into, I would call it a neutral category, where you're doing some evil to do some good. Um, and so, what I'm again, what I'm saying is these goblins, even as they're written, yes, they could be those evil sneaky goblins in the cave that just go out and run out and love to like, you know, capture creatures and livestock or uh, and, and lure adventurers to their deaths and all these crazy sneaky things. But or they, they could be, you know, very secretive uh, farmers who just tend to have a lot of snares out around their fields. And, and you know, they they're not going to go out and fight you because it's not worth it to them. They'll abandon their field if, if you get past their snares and uh, kind of just save their own lives and their family's lives while you go and ransack the place and, and then they'll come back after you leave and put things back together and go back to work. Maybe you've got those kind of goblins in your world. This, this game, or this entry, doesn't really assume one or the other. So I kind of like it for that. It's easy for me to look at this and then modify it to be anything. Um, so let's finish up. Interactions, goblins are lying tricksters. Okay, well, thanks for that. <laughs> Everything I just said kind of went out the window for that with, with some of that. But again, you can modify this to change it any way you like. It's your world. Don't let you know one monster entry uh, define how you want to view something. Um, but can be cowed into cooperating for short periods. Mm. Uh, uses, uh, well, they are suggested to be used as thieves and murderers. Okay, again, flying in the face of everything I just said. Jeez, thanks, guys. Uh, goblins are foes to all, even to rival goblin tribes. Well, shucks. I still think they can be good people in my game. Because <laughs> I kind of, I'm actually really liking this, this, like, trap-laden goblin farmer settlement where like they're really just like good country folk but they're goblins everyone assumes that there's something nefarious going on and really they're just growing turnips but no one believes them <laughs> just have fun with that and have like the players they're like there's this goblin settlement you got to get rid of it they're they're monsters and they're they're gonna do these terrible things and the players roll up like ready to fight and it's like tur turnip farmers going oh yep hi oh how can i help you um, please don't walk. Uh, no, please, please don't walk. Oh, you walked over there, and that your leg's gonna be hurting for a while. You know that is your fault, not mine. Um, anyway, loot. Well, aside from weapons, each goblin tends to carry a personal stash, including bones, shiny rocks, sticks, and other bits of worthless trash, plus currency equivalent to an inexpensive item. So these are things that you. You know, you can use this this style of goblin if you want. If you want a standard goblin, this this works well. If you want to have a slightly different goblin, modify one or two things from this description, and you're good to go. Uh, it does have a suggestion for a GM intrusion. Uh, the goblin poison. Uh, the goblin poisoned its knife. If struck, a the character must make a might defense roll or immediately make a uh, move one step down the damage track. So that's a pretty powerful intrusion right there if someone were to roll a one. Uh, I, I kind of like that, and I think that is especially that's really painful if, you're, you know, if, if your players are really overconfident. That's something you can, you can hit them with with these goblins. Like, oh, these goblins, we can, like, anyone can take on goblins, and these goblins uh, manage to poison them and make them have a very hard time because of it. So those are two monster uh, entries that we're all pretty familiar with, with how those creatures are generally in fantasy tropes. So I'm going to talk about one more because I said I'd do three. And this one is the orc. And I'm doing an orc because, again, Almost everyone that does fantasy is familiar with orcs. If you are a fan of Lord of the Rings, you know what an orc is. An orc is a good baseline uh, creature for a lot of people to more, more commonly recognize, especially also you know, if you're 
a fan of World of Warcraft, you know there's a lot of different kinds of orcs and different ways to with different ways to orc. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm having fun at this point. So for the orc, they're considered a level two monster. So their their challenge, uh, their difficulty rating is uh, yeah. No, sorry, their target number is six. But what does that translate to? So, their motives make others more miserable than itself. Mm, excuse me. So, that tells you right away that this entry is designed for a specific kind of orc. We can ignore all of that and make this into a different type of orc easily. So I'm going to kind of ignore a lot of the, the fluffy stuff because we've already talked about that with the goblin. Let's talk about just the rules. Okay? Okay. Health, seven. One point higher than the six that's usually listed for a, a level two monster. Damage inflicted, four. Double what's usually on there for a, a level two monster. Okay? Armor, two. Okay, that's standard. Movement, short. Modification, speed defense as level three when carrying a shield. Pleasant interactions as level one. All right, that, that helps. So if, if they're trying to interact with the party or if the party is trying to interact with them in a pleasant way, uh, they're, they're rolling against target number three. Uh, well, that that could be awkward. I can see where the, that the things can make that awkward, but uh, you know how you run is up to you. Okay. Uh, combat. Most orcs have bows able to target foes within long range. Some carry a shield and wield a medium axe, sword, or mace. Four points of damage are inflicted. That's standard. That's medium medium weapon damage. Um, other orcs, usually those that are larger than their fellows, dispense with shields and wield heavy two-handed weapons and hammers that inflict six points of damage. Okay. Okay, and then it goes into orcs live short, brutish lives. The few that survive four years do so because of some special advantage they they're sneakier, stronger, tougher, or meaner. So, so they have the following modifications. Uh, stealth tasks at level 5. Deal 2 additional points of damage with melee weapons. as a plus 10 to their health. And tasks related, related to trickery and deceit as level 5. Okay. And the rest of it is all stories about how you could do, use these orcs. Those are some good ideas... Those are, those are some good stats for an orc. Uh, it shows you different, different ways you can play with things. So one of the things that I wanted to really illustrate using these three very common tropes, trope creatures, is what you can do with that difficulty class or, or level, you know, monster level rubric for Cypher system. Because you're not, you don't have to only stick to what we talked about of, you know, a difficulty class two monster has a target number of six and therefore has health of six and uh, defense of two, sorry, armor of two and deals two damage on things. You don't have to stick to that. You can mix and match and move things around if you want, because that's what almost all of these monsters do. And if you want to add special abilities, you can do that. And just they're, they're the things that key off of that uh, the monster's level and the difficulty task of dealing with that monster and so and it's okay to have you know an orc that has pleasant social interactions as level three if you want if you if you want your one of these orcs to be a bit more savvy a bit more glib perhaps and you make that quick change and, and that's okay um, it's easy to modify this stuff it doesn't change a whole lot if you do that it just it changes that aspect of the monster and sometimes those aspects that can make all the difference there's a lot of variety here if um, I mean if you want to have a weaker orc 
you just you know lower the difficulty number if you want to have tougher orcs then you raise it and you can give them more armor you can give them better weapons excuse me there's all sorts of things you can do and that's part of what's cool about the cipher system is it is i don't want to say infinitely customizable because that's to me that's a loaded phrase but it is very customizable and it's very easy to do that so it not only can you change a lot of stuff in the system on lickety split but you can do so easily not just fast but easily and i think that's the important part it's harder you have to try to break the cipher system you really have to actually be aiming for some for making something that's broken in order to make stuff not work as long as you you kind of work within the ballpark of each of these monsters stat blocks you're gonna have something that's okay excuse me anyway i am yawning a lot so i'm gonna go get some sleep thank you for joining me for this video this is another short video well short for me about the cypher system and i hope you enjoyed it if you'd like to see more content like this please uh, like the video maybe leave a comment down below let me know what other stuff you'd like me to talk about if there's anything in particular and uh, i'd love it if you'd subscribe to the channel i think that would be great uh, i really make this content uh, partially because it makes me happy but also because i'm trying to find the things that other people want to see i like uh D, D, but i don't always have to talk about it uh, i will if that's the only thing people want to hear about but right now it seems like some people want to hear about cipher so i'm going to keep talking about cipher as long as i maintain my personal interest in it and it kind of got a good amount of interest in it until i but there are other systems that i want to cover too um and, and i will maybe not tonight because i'm gonna go sleep <laughs> so anyway this is me rambling on. I hope you all have a good night. Thank you so much. Peace be with you. Bye-bye.